there's an athletic competition going on in in sport, but there's also a science competition. And at that time, when you were skating, obviously, the Eastern Bloc, Eastern Germany, a lot of those Eastern European countries, I think Placid was no one tested positive for any (laughs) enhancing substance. Um, It's just surprising, you know, uh, and, and a lot of the strength, strength and conditioning, the periodization, the sports physiology that people use today, obviously a lot of it's American, but a lot of it comes from older Eastern, yeah. Eastern European, like, um, yeah. especially like um, strength and conditioning, the weightlifting principles of whether it's Bulgaria or Russia or Germany, um, you know, there's a competition going on in science, in healing as well, in sports medicine with trainers and, yeah. uh, no, but, you know, again, you know, back then, um, when it came to uh, sports performance and, you know, doping and that kind of stuff. A lot of that stuff was coming out of Eastern Europe and the drugs of choice back then were basically amphetamine type uh, medications uh, Mm -hmm. and then anabolic steroids. Um, Eastern Europeans were kind of notorious for doing that and occasionally somebody would get caught. Usually it was, again, Eastern Europe, Russia kind of stuff. Um, the Eastern European, East German women's speed skating team, I mean, they crushed it. Yeah. Uh, and it was about the same time that their swimmers were also really crushing it. Um, I don't think any of those women were ever caught positive, but I'm sure they were on the same medical program, program. as yeah. their swimmers. Um, and a That's lot of this yeah. science was coming out of um, Eastern Europe when it came to the exercise science and that kind of thing. And yeah, they were kind of dominant in aerobic power sports back then. When we were in Sochi, um, I found it interesting because, you know, the trainers, um, you, you accompany the athlete into doping control. You're there with the athlete representing them, making sure the procedures are followed. And sometimes they're a minor. So you have to, you're, 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 protecting the athlete. But when we were in Sochi, I found it interesting that through the games, no one was coming up positive in, in just the games in general. Yeah. And then you hear about obviously the Icarus <laughs> movie and um, it's disappointing because in uh, and, and this, this goes into cycling too. Um, it's just, does the sport can't, will it ever be clean in cycling? Will elite sport ever be clean? Cause even the sports med stuff we're pushing, we're trying to like, help you know yeah. and and 40 years ago it didn't even exist you know yeah no with if, if you're part of a sports medicine sports science team um the thing that you do is you know first you try to identify the parameters that make for a good outcome then you look at the individual athletes and identify sort of their physiologic makeup and you know what are they good at what are they not good at how can you improve those things that they're not good at so that you can maximize the potential of that athlete and make sure that the, their physiology their mechanics their psychology nutrition those kinds of things can you improve on what they already have or change things that you so that you can make them better Sports are, um, there's a lot of money in sports. And anytime there's a lot of money, there are people who are going to try to really push the envelope. Um, You have the World Anti-Doping Association that really tries to keep people within safe parameters when it comes to to doing that. But there's always people who are going to try to play the system. And... um, Cycling was notorious for that. And there was a time when it was really the Wild West in, in cycling. And a medication called erythropoietin potent showed up. Um, it would allow you to increase your hemoglobin mass. And um, yeah. it's like going from regular octane gas to, you know, av gas. Where S- supercharged. Supercharged, yeah. yeah. And nobody could detect it. Everybody knew it was very beneficial. Um, yeah. And... So if you wanted to be successful in the world of aerobic sports, I'm sure it was going on in track and field, but cycling was sort of called out for it. You were for a while, you know, there's probably five years, maybe a decade where if you weren't doing that, you were not in the professional ranks of those sports. Um, You just wouldn't be competitive. 
I was in uh, the mountains once uh, for the pro cycling challenge and it was the day Lance Armstrong came out and said he was doping. It was literally that day, but we're watching the start of the pro site and they're introducing everyone. Yeah. And I forget his name, but this, they introduced him as a, a pass Tour de France winner. And he was, if you look at the list, he's the last guy in the middle of this period that hadn't been caught, you know? Yeah. So everyone was just kind of quiet, <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, we've heard people say, you know, that race is so grueling that the yeah. athletes should have a supplemental program yeah. to get through it better, healthier. Uh, you know, generally, no, we don't believe in that, but is it really that hard of a race? No, it's exactly. getting to insane levels. Is this healthy for the athlete down the road? Cause we deal with most of the athletes around here. Most people identify you as part of the cycling community and in, in the yeah. Boulder area, they, they'll ask me about it. And, um, Re, you know, degenerative changes on the joints, you know, arthritic, yeah. early arthritic strategies from stem cell to PRP to yeah. micro fracture. I mean, everyone's trying to minimize the damage long term. Uh, is the Tour de France just crushing it's, these guys long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's a hard race. I mean, it's three three weeks long. Um, you know, I had experience in, in speed skating and in, in experience in cycling and the time, the times that I've spent at the world tour, or grand tour level, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, is it more but, metabolic damage rather than say orthopedic damage? Is it just a big strain on the system? It's a big strain on the system. I think you'd consider it more metabolic than it's really musculoskeletal. Um, but you know, there is issues with your, your muscle system over time, your gly glycogen, stores get depleted. Uh, nowadays, there are ways to sort of measure glycogen stores. And that's a big thing that now is sort of uh, being a part of training within these long endurance sports. Sure. Biggest thing that we worry about from an orthopedic side of thing with the cyclists is basically osteoporosis or osteopenia. Because uh, okay. a lot of these guys are spending a lot of time in sort of a non weight bearing sport and they're having sort of uh fractures that you would expect to have see in postmenopausal women um, interesting so yeah, are they on are they on bone stimulation meds and do they have to get a therapeutic exemption if they're actually competing or is this a longer term issue this uh is really it's a longer term issue they are not on any medications for trying to maintain bone mass yeah um but you know they they have these sort of incidental falls and they're ending up with wrist fractures, hip fractures, things that you see in sort of the, okay. the elderly population. And these are young, healthy individuals where you shouldn't see these kinds of fractures. And every time you see, if you're working with a cycling team, every time you see somebody fall, it's like, oh gosh, what are they yeah. doing now? Where in, in the past, very often these guys were more well-rounded athletes and not spending as much time on a bicycle as they are now. And Specialists, yeah. Yeah, these injuries... Yeah. These falls were not resulting in these catastrophic injuries for these guys. Strength and conditioning, stressing the bone, the bone responds to the stress you put upon it. But if you're on a bike for your career or your whole athletic career, uh, you're not you're not supporting bone density. Like if you're a well-rounded athlete. Yeah. yeah, no, not at all. And that's why, you know, you wonder about these guys because a lot of times you sort of bank your bone mass when you're younger. And then over as you get older, it's uh, always a, you're in a deficit, a chronic deficit. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with sort of this newer generation of cyclists as they mature uh, and get to be, you know, you know, like my age in the 50s and 60s, what kind of bone quality that they have and what kind of injuries that they're going to sustain, you know, 